make room for you And so long as the hunger level is there and the thirst is there for God, you can guarantee that God's going to be there, whether that's for a group of people or whether it's for you as an individual. If you desire God, you will have it. You will have him, I should say. And I, I say this quote sometimes that all of us have as much of God as we want, meaning that if you feel uh, very far from God or distant from God, it's because you have not drawn near to God. The scripture says, draw near to God and he will draw near unto you. And so all of us are exactly where we want to be in our spiritual journey. If you want to be on fire and passionate, then you have diligently sought the Lord. The Bible says in Jeremiah that if you seek the Lord, he says, seek me with all your heart and then you'll, I'll be found by you. And so all of us, again, prayerfully are on this journey together. But I want to share with you what I shared a little bit on Wednesday night, because, again, I've alluded to this already, but I am under the persuasion that the scripture that says, unless the Lord builds the house, they that build it labor in vain. I mean, that. I don't know if you guys can really relate to that because maybe you've never tried to build anything. Maybe you've never stepped out by faith and tried to obey God. But when we stepped out by faith to obey God, the Lord will always give us a vision that is so grand and so big that it's impossible without him. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And so when we began the ministry three years ago, God showed me a vision in accordance with Isaiah 56, 7, which talks about the house of prayer. He said, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. And so for the last three years or so, three and a half years, we've been praying and we've been seeking God. We've been worshiping. And I mean, we've pretty much from Genesis to Revelation gone through everything in the Bible. We've talked about pretty much all that, that you can really talk about. And with that being said, I came to this place in the last year or so. And this is where I want to just be as vulnerable because this will help you. You know, people I've found out in pastoring that people don't necessarily need to see uh, your bulging spiritual biceps. In other words, I don't need to appear to you as the great and mighty preacher of the gospel. What you need to do is see the great and mighty God that you serve. My job is like John the Baptist. He said, I must decrease so that Jesus can increase. I'm going to get out the way. If I'm doing my job right, then you will think less of me and more of him. Not that you think of me in, in a, you know, in a disrespectful way or dishonorable way, but truly the preacher's job is to point people to God. And in the culture and the church that we are part of in this generation, we see the exact opposite. We see, by and large, many preachers pointing people to themselves. Amen. Y'all live in this country. You see it. Anytime the name or the personality behind the ministry is bigger than the name of Jesus, then you know you are in a place which is not honoring God. And so there's, there's tension and there's all sorts of things that we have to wrestle with. But the testimony begins in this fashion. In the past year, I have felt a strain in my spirit to maintain a first love for God. You know, I wrote it. I told them on Wednesday. I wrote in my journal. Actually, I think it was on Wednesday that, Lord, I'm almost home. And what that meant was, if you recall the story of the prodigal, how many of you show of hands are familiar with the story of the prodigal son? In the Bible, there's a story of this prodigal son who it says that he, you know, he asked for his inheritance and he goes off and he wastes his living with, with all sorts of just riotous living. And he's living a life of um, you know, self-indulgence. And he comes to the end of himself and he says, I'm going to go back to my father's house. And says when he was just a long ways off, his father is out there and he sees him a far way off. And then he said, my son who was dead is alive. And he goes out to meet him. And you know the story. He puts on him a new robe and a new ring and new sandals and throws a feast for his son who they believed to have been dead, but found him to be alive. And because that story is most commonly connected to the idea of running away or leaving, we assume that the word prodigal means run away or that's just the natural connection when you understand the gist of the story. But the reality is that word prodigal in the Greek language, it just simply means wasteful. It doesn't mean runaway. It doesn't mean I am, you know, a vagabond. It means wasteful. And the Lord showed me that I was becoming a prodigal, yet I was faithful to the church and the ministry. And the Lord said that there are many people who are faithful to the church, but they're actually prodigal in their heart. That they're still physically in attendance, 
They still show up to prayer. They still show up to Bible study. They still give their tithes and their offering out of this compulsion or this maybe learned behavior even of religiosity that they do what's expected of them as good Christians. That's why again today I said we're not even making a big deal about the offering. If you want to give, give. That's kind of how I left it. Because we have learned how to be good boys and good girls. And we've learned how to do everything that's expected of us. But many times, even in our good behavior, externally, our hearts are drawn far away from God. And you, you need all the external stimuli to get you back to a place of worship. That's why even again today in worship, when people sing cover songs or music that you're familiar with, that you've heard on the radio or have on your MP3 player, it's easy to engage because we're used to tagging along everybody else. But God said, I'm coming back for those that would worship me in spirit and in truth. And when you're worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth, there ought to be something coming out of you. It should not be dependent on what's on the outside, but what's on the inside. And the Lord said, there are many people that have lost the ability to worship from the inside out. And now without the right of music and right of environment around them, they are walled off from the presence of God. And I'll tell you, if that's your story today, that God can fix that. Because that was beginning to become my story. And for the last year, I stepped into the role, of course, as the pastor um, with Hope City in 2011. And then last November, um, some of the members from all nations joined Hope City. And for a few months, we were there together on the east side until the Lord worked out a way for us to buy this building. And during that time, you know, we've also been praying for unity of the body. We've been praying God unite the races, Lord, unite the generations. And so I've been doing everything I can to bridge the gap, going out to different churches and making connections. And in other words, trying to become the answer to my prayer. And I believe that's a good thing, but that's a bad thing when your heart is disconnected from your mission, because the thing that God has called us to is himself, not an assignment. The assignment that God has for your life is secondary. Whether you're called to prophesy, preach, teach, start a business, whatever you believe the Lord has called you to do, that is secondary. You are called to know God. And I found myself in the past year doing what I was called to do, but ignoring the one who called me. When I was hearing the Holy Spirit whisper to me and saying, draw away with me, get away from people, come and just study the word, not to preach a sermon, not to uh, sound good, not to sound learned, but just to know me and let the word burn in your heart like it once did. I found that more often than not, my excuse was I can't today. I'm too busy. I have a lot going on. Everybody wants to meet up with me. Everybody wants my time. And so, God, I have to put you back here. But you understand because I'm doing your business. And the Lord, in his fatherly way, his merciful way, will only let you go but so far with that paradigm. Because you got to understand the Lord is jealous for you. And as Jared, I think it was Jared, somebody was praying or singing this morning that the Lord is not coming back for the building. He's coming back for a bride. Amen. Did y'all hear what I just said? Amen. The building could be blown away with a tornado in the blink of an eye, but you and I are the purchased possession. Amen. And the priority from God's point of view is not this building. It's not an outreach ministry. It's not a record deal. It's not a book deal. It's not growing a congregation. It's not anything. The priority is your soul. And the Lord, you know, it's like, again, the scripture says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his soul? And I can find myself gaining the whole ministry world. You can find yourself gaining the whole business world. Whatever that world is that you're going after, you can gain all of that and yet lose your soul in the process. And so the Lord said that many of you perhaps are even becoming like the prodigal, faithful attendees, givers, preachers. But hearts, small. Capacity to love, small. Tears, absent. Burden for the lost world, nowhere to be found. You have to beg people to worship. Have to beg people to come to church. Have to beg them to come on time if they're ministers. And God said, that system is not what I'm building. I'm not building a house like that. The house that I'm building is a house of worship from the inside out. And if the Lord has chosen me to be a forerunner in that, then I myself have to fight for that. And all of us have to fight for that first love. Amen. So my testimony in this past year is that as I stepped out and started to make connections and wrestled, you know, kind of like the story of David. If you guys remember, is it OK if I talk to you from the heart today? 
Is it okay if I don't, you know, tune up and get all sermonic on you and try to impress you with good preaching skills today? Can I be regular? Amen. It's kind of like the story of David. Uh, if you remember when he went out to kill Goliath and Saul gives him his armor and David's walking around in the armor and he says, I haven't tried these. He said, I can't, I, I can't do nothing with this. And so he resorts back to what he knew. He went back to the slingshot, the same slingshot that he had when he was defending his father's sheep and his testimony that he gained in the wilderness. And when Saul said to him, you can't defeat him because he uh, has been fighting since his youth and you're but a youth. And he says, but the same God that delivered me from the lion and from the bear, from the paw of the lion and the bear, will deliver me from this uncircumcised Philistine. So that's what happened in this past year for me. I found myself in Saul's armor trying to go up against Goliath. And in my spirit, I said, this is not, this is not what's going to be victorious because it's not really about the armor or the weapon. It's about being true to God in the way that God called you to do what he's called you to do. And I think some of you might actually get set free if you stop trying to play the role and just become a friend of God. I'm saying that because, again, it's my story. And... Again, processing all this, the Lord is, is very merciful. The past year, um, I've had high highs and some low lows, like all of us, I'm sure. Times where I felt this rush of the presence of God, this supernatural swirl of His glory, and all that wonderful stuff that happens very regular in service time. But then when you get alone by yourself... Where is that anointing at? Where is the glory at? Where is that joy unspeakable at? Where are all these marvelous feelings in those moments when the crowd is gone? Yeah. And I found myself being drugged in a sense. That's just an imperfect analogy. But similar to like the effect of a drug on someone that as long as you have that drug running through your system, you experience the delusion or the euphoria of the high. But as soon as it wears off, you're back to whatever steady condition you were in before. And it gets even harder. That's why alcoholics, you might have got drunk drinking one beer when you first got drunk. But then 10 years down the road of alcoholism, it takes you 340 ounces before you feel anything. Or one puff or one, one inhale of marijuana and you were high as a kite. This is some people who used to be that, but got saved. Hey man, I ain't talking about right now. Please don't misunderstand where I'm going with this. But then you smoke so much that, man, you can smoke a whole lot and still not hardly feel anything. But God, you got delivered. Amen. Set free. <laughs> and I found myself in a very similar state where fire in the night or Bible study or corporate prayer was kind of like that same sort of uh, stimulant for my spirit where I could stir myself up when people are around. But it wasn't always like that. And I wrestled for the whole year like, Lord, I don't know what's going on. I preach and you anoint me. Um, you know, people get saved. I love the Lord. I'm not operating in any sort of sin. I'm not doing anything. I don't have skeletons in my closet. I love the Lord. I love my wife. I love the people around me. I don't know what's wrong with me because after these moments pass by, I go back to this place of like despairing even unto death at times. And I couldn't understand like, God, what is that? And sometimes you can be underneath of a burden so long you don't even know you're under a burden. And sometimes you can be experiencing God's chastisement and not even know that you're being chastised. Because see, a lot of times we think of chastisement from the Lord. You know, the scripture says the Lord chastens every son whom he received, right? Unless you're illegitimate and you're not truly a child of God. But one thing I've learned about the chastening of the Lord is that it's preventive. It's not always a reaction. So if your child does something wrong, you might slap him on the wrist and say, bad, don't do that again. That's a reaction to a bad behavior. But we serve the all-wise God, the sovereign God, who can actually see the end from the beginning, the beginning from the end. He exists outside of time, and so nothing catches him by surprise. And in his mercy, he will disrupt a pattern that might not have manifested into full-blown sin. But there's latent desires, there's seeds in your heart, and God says, I've got to disrupt that before it becomes destruction. You know, in the Bible, in James, it says that God doesn't tempt anyone, but each one is enticed by his own desires. And that desires raises up and becomes sin. And sin, when it's fully conceived, brings forth death. God will stop it the moment the desire begins to show up. And so I can't explain it to you. I don't know, case in point, the science of all that. Or how many demons were involved. Or how many this and that was involved. All I know is that I was under the fire. 
in the past year, and I found myself waking up many days wondering like how I could get out of this. Why? I've been blessed beyond any pastor I know in three years. Some of the best, greatest people I can imagine to work with. And yet, in my heart, with no obvious sin in my life, still wanting to just not be involved. Now, you need to know, too, that there is an accuser who does come to steal, kill, and destroy. <laughs> Don't be ignorant of his devices. But what I found myself in this past year uh, doing unconsciously, and this is the deception of sin, unconsciously doing this but preaching against it, was that I was becoming a man pleaser. Unconscious of that. Not consciously trying to please you, like, and actually speaking against it. But on the inside, as the Holy Spirit revealed this to me, said, you are uh, pleasing men. And I said, Lord, what do you mean? He said, well, why did you start dressing a certain way? I said, well, Lord, your house is holy. I want to come before you in spirit and in truth. And I want to uphold the bloodstained banner. And I want to, and the Lord said, stop. Don't give me the speech. The reality is you are worried about the perception of the people. Now, this is the latent dormant stuff. If I get up here with my three-piece suit on, my clergy collar, and I do it like y'all like to have it done, oh, yeah, you preaching, and I'm, I'm joining that church. And the Lord said, that's not the house I'm building. Because if it takes means of the flesh to draw people, it's going to take means of the flesh to keep people. And the moment that that fleshly drawing mechanism is out of the picture, the people are out of the picture. That means that they, they love you when you do what you want. they want you to do. But the moment you change or flip the script a little bit, they're out the door as soon as they came in the door. And God said, that's not my house. You can build one of them if you want to and see how far you get and be like everybody else and burn out. Or you can do it my way. And again, I'm not against dressing up. I actually like to dress up. You might come next week and I'll be dressed up. I don't care what you wear. You know, I really don't. You want to wear dress up, dress up, because do it as unto the Lord. You know what I mean? So I'm not really caught up on any of that. But this, again, is just my, my testimony, and I'm sharing it to help some of y'all. So then, next thing the Lord asked me is, you know, in worship. Now, this is really getting personal. The Lord said, what, why did you stop playing the guitar? Why did you stop joining the congregation for worship? I will say, well, Lord, there's others here and they need to go forth. And, you know, I need to be preparing the atmosphere of my heart. And, 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 and the Lord said, don't give me the speech. Right. Truth is, you don't want to. <laughs> don't want to. I told this on Wednesday that you know, for years, I would, my mom would remember when I was living with her, when I was uh, mid, early 20s, <laughs> um, around the house, all hours of the day. I mean, when she was home, at least she probably ran into that, but many times she was working, of course. But when I would be home, sometimes with her there, many times even by myself, spent hours playing the guitar, worshiping the Lord. You know the story of David? He didn't become the great psalmist of Israel when he became the king. He became a worshiper at closed doors. He didn't write the Psalms to be sung and read by thousands and millions one day, but in a secret place out of his brokenness, he wrote the Psalms. So now we read it and think it's a bestseller, but really that was his journal. And so I was a Davidic type of person. I had a heart after God. I was going after God with all my heart. And then the busyness of ministry or life starts to settle in. And how many of you can remember a time in your life where your heart was on fire for Jesus and then you got that nine to five that you prayed for? Then you got that dream job that now you're not working just 40 hours. You might be working 60 hours a week. And so now you got time to work, but you don't have time to spend with God. Now I'm going to ask you that. What's more valuable, your soul or your bank account? Who's willing to take a lesser job so they can have more time with God if the Lord leads you to do that? Amen. Because God will lead some to do that. Some he will not. But that was, again, that's my story. So as the Holy Spirit, it was uh, December. It was actually the day before, two days before New Year's. I was in Kansas City at a conference uh, hosted by the International House of Prayer called the One Thing Conference. Now, most of you know that our uh, watchword around here is based off of Psalm, Psalm 27, 4, where King David said, there's one thing I desire of the Lord. That will I seek. His whole life ambition was to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to dwell in his house always. At all, I mean, that's if you read it for yourself, Psalm 27, 4. So they named the conference one thing after that verse. I go to this conference where I first really had this revelation 
back in probably 2006 or so when the Holy Spirit just, <laughs> man, just met me in a powerful way. I mean, life-changing way. Anybody ever had a moment like that? Just between you and the Lord, you remember where you were, what you were wearing, what the room smelled like, who was around, because that moment was real for you. It was a moment where eternity or time stopped and you just jumped into eternity. So one thing was kind of like my Bethel place in a sense, the place where God is. And there was so many things going on. I hadn't been to one thing in a few years because in the last three years or so, busy with ministry, can of course miss service because of course God be a good, faithful pastor. And the Lord said, this year, go. So I went for a couple days. And on the 30th, I think it was, of December, I found myself sitting almost in the exact same spot as I was many years before where the Lord met with me. And I remember for about a whole hour and a half, I just wept and cried. And I was thankful to the Lord for bringing me back to my first love. You know, those are some powerful moments when you return to where you began and you can look back and say, God has been faithful to me. I have done everything possible to blow it. I have gone astray. I've missed the mark. I've fumbled the ball. I've went out of bounds. But yet God has kept me. And then you sit there and you remember him and you feed from his faithfulness. And that's where you're revived at. So I found myself experiencing this personal revival. And even after that service, me and my wife, when we were going back to our hotel, we didn't hardly speak a word. Because the spirit of the fear of the Lord, the holiness of God was so strong on both of us that we, you know, sometimes God will just come on you and you don't want to talk to nobody. It's because you're almost like afraid to talk like this is a holy moment and you know it. We have one of those types of moments. And then a series of events happen, you know, to confirm, you know, a couple of things in my life. I'm going to speed this up for you. One of the things that also happened in this past year was I had stopped journaling. Now, how many of you journal? I would encourage everybody to get you a journal. Some of you say, well, that's girly. Well, that's because you never tried it. You don't buy into this social stigma. You need to get a journal. I'm serious about that. Just record what God does. You don't got to write no dear diary, my life, you know, whatever. But just keep a record of the faithfulness of God because trust me when I tell you, you will forget what God has done for you. You will. You'll forget about it so fast. And this past year, I have not journaled. When we moved into this building, we got all this stuff mixed up in boxes. And I, I, um, I lost my journals. I couldn't find them. And I'm thinking like, Lord... I know me. What activates my heart is writing down. I always felt like the pen was kind of like this key to my heart that as I would write, God would unlock the door if in my heart. Does anybody know what I'm saying? It's, it's just something powerful about writing your prayers out or writing your heart out before God in a secret way where no one else knows but you and the Lord. Well, I lost my journal. So like eight months past, I haven't journaled. I haven't picked up the guitar. I come back from one thing. And I'm, I'm starting to get sick in my stomach. I'm like, I need to find my journals. I feel like I'm about to die. I, I can't, I mean, I'm losing sleep at night. Now I'm preaching these wonderful messages and so people tell me and people are getting slain in the spirit at the altar and people are dancing and twirling and doing all the stuff people do in prophetic worship and stuff. And I'm thinking like, but why do I feel dead on the inside when this is over with? And I was praying like, God, please. I was thinking, I don't want to buy a new one. I just need to read my old ones. Well, God being God, about three weeks ago, I'm rummaging through some boxes and I found my whole stack of journals. <laughs> That's the Lord. And I start rereading the journal and, um, and I just started crying and weeping like, Lord, how far have I gone? You know, I have advanced in a sense, like I know more. Um, you use me in greater ways, but I don't feel the same love for you that I once did. And that's painful if you've ever loved God. Anybody know what I mean? I mean, sometimes married couples will renew their vows to kind of like restore that freshness to their marriage. And I would say sometimes we need to renew our love vows to the Lord. You know, life is hard. We all are going through a lot. We're in a world full of corruption and in a world full of death. And sometimes it's easy to let the pressure from the outside take away the joy on the inside. So I found myself losing that. And I thank God as I started to read I almost felt like living water being poured into my soul again. Then another miracle happened. How many of you know music is powerful? How many of you can think of a certain few songs that if you hear them songs, especially Christian songs, that would take you right back to where you are in your walk with God? And I don't know what it was. Maybe I just get tired of hearing some of the stuff I came up in the faith on. 
But I burnt the CD for somebody about eight years ago, and out of nowhere, three weeks ago, they came up to me and said, I don't know why, but you burnt me this CD several years ago, and the Lord told me to <laughs> burn a fresh copy and give it to you. And so I'm in here one day, and I'm, it sat on my counter for a couple of days, and I said, I'm going to just put that CD in. Man, as these songs begin to play, songs that when I got saved, I would listen to on repeat one for like months. You know, this one song called None But Jesus by Hillsong, um, another song by the Vineyard called Above All Else. And the thing that I noticed about all these things on songs on this mixtape that I made for this person was all of these songs were about Jesus. It wasn't no, no dance music. It wasn't no praise music. It was just Jesus, 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 Jesus. From day one, anybody that has known me has known that my whole life has just been Jesus, 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 Jesus. Now, I've maintained the rhetoric, but I've again lost the reality. So as I'm hearing this music, my heart is starting to kindle once again. Yeah. <laughs> ah. Sorry. Amen. <laughs> and so I'm listening to this music. I find my journals. I start writing again. Then the Lord says, pick the guitar up again. I hadn't played the guitar. I don't remember the last time I played a guitar until the other day. And the Lord said, begin to play and worship me. So around the house, I start playing the guitar a little bit. And I was like, man, like, why did I ever stop? And it's because I lost desire. You know, when you lose desire for God, you will stop worshiping. I'm telling you, worship, if you're really a true worshiper, you can't even fake it. You can't fake it. The real worshipers can't fake it. Church people can fake it. But when you know the real thing, you won't, you have too much spiritual integrity to even fake it. And that's kind of how I was. I'm like, man, I can't do that. Like, it's not in my heart. I'm not going to put this profane fire on the altar before the Lord. God, you got to do surgery on me because I want my song back. And then I'm reading Psalm 51 because the last few weeks the Holy Spirit said speak and talk about David. So we've been studying the life of David and I'm reading Psalm 51 a lot lately. And you know what David said, restore unto me the joy of salvation. He said, renew a right spirit in me, create a clean heart in me. He says, take not thy Holy Spirit away from me. And so that began to be my prayer over the last month or so. And then on Wednesday, again, coming full circle. Last Wednesday, as I sat down to journal for the first time, I found a journal that was dated from three years ago that still had a page left. And I wrote those words, Lord, I'm almost home. Thank you for being faithful to me. And I can't explain that to you. all I wish I could hype that up for you. But something supernatural happened when I wrote those words, when I acknowledged that I had gone away. And see, so far, so many times I had actually, like, out of probably pride and fear of my own opinion of myself, as deceptive as that sounds, denied the fact that I was drifting away from God because I was in denial. Like, I, no way, I'm not far from God. I preach about being far from God. I'm not far from God. I tell everybody else to be close to God. That's what I always preach about. There's no way I could be the one far from God. I don't have any blatant sins in my life. I'm at prayer. I'm leading the charge. I'm doing this by faith. I read the Bible, but in denial of the fact that I had drifted in my heart away from God. As I wrote those words out, I said, Lord, I give up. I have been trying to play this role even before God. The people are, I don't care what people think. That's a, probably a, a fault of my personality. I should probably care a little bit more what people think. That's probably pride as well. But even before God, here I am pretending as if God doesn't know my end from my beginning. And my beginning from my end, my inside out from my outside in. My rising up, my lying down. And so for the past year, I have been, I had been in denial. I had been under delusion. I have been performing well, I have been smiling, I have been dancing, I have been praying, I have been faithful, but I have been a prodigal. And I was worried about your opinions. Worried about it. Oh, what if I don't? They won't come back next week. Guess what? Don't come back. Go where you can be blessed. If you can't be blessed here, I don't have no problem with that. If you're being called here, then be here. I don't, it's not my thing. If you want a heart to go after God, you want to be in a community of people who are going after God, then come. Yes. And we'll do it together. Thank you, Lord. But if that's not where you are, we'll pray for you. The Lord said, detach yourself from any responsibility for results. Yes. I know I said a mouthful there. Detach yourself, Brian Williams, from any responsibility for the results. 
Well, Lord, if I, if we have this type of a service, and if I get very demonstrative and preach like that, then that's going to cause some people to be drawn. If I talk candidly, that's going to cause others to be drawn. The Lord said, why are you worried about who comes? Jesus said this, if I be lifted up, I will draw men to myself. The goal of the church is to lift Jesus up. The goal of the preacher is to lift Jesus up. If Jesus is exalted, the ones who love Jesus, who came here for Jesus, will be drawn. The people who are here for the food, for the miracle, for the external experience, they're not coming back anyway. So don't worry about them because my house will be built on a foundation of faithfulness. And I'm looking for those that worship me in spirit and in truth. Are not concerned with the appearance, not concerned with as the false apostles boasting in the outward. But the goal of the Holy Spirit is to bring forth a bride in wholeness and completeness from the inside out that loves Jesus. And he said, all I've asked you to do is agree with me. And I say that as an example to all of you. All God has ever asked you to do was agree with him. Some of you need to be free today from the expectations you have put on yourself. The expectations you've allowed a prophetic word over your life to put on yourself. All God wants for you is for you to love him. With all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. If you love him with all your soul, mind, and strength, then guess what? You will be faithful. The Lord said you won't ever have to preach and teach and ever beg anybody to give anything because when people love God, they give. That's an offering. The church does not collect donations. This is not a nonprofit organization that needs donors to sustain itself. This is the house of the Lord. God puts people in the house that love him. The overflow of love is giving for God so loved the world that he gave. We don't have a giving problem. It's not that people don't understand tithing. It's not that people don't understand how we're supposed to honor God with money. It's that their hearts are far from God. When the people's heart was toward God, Moses had to stop them from giving. In the book of Acts, everybody sold everything they had and gave everything because their hearts were one with each other and with God. And the Lord said, don't ever waste another moment worried about how much money comes in that offering. Trust me. Don't be a man pleaser. Don't be a people pleaser. And that's the kind of community that God has called us to be. We're going to do so much more in the days to come. We've already done a whole lot, a lot of outreach, lots of wonderful stuff happening at Ohio State, lots of stuff happening on the streets, lots of stuff happening with all these events and individual people's ministries, all sorts of fruitfulness. But at the end of the day, you know what? It's a bunch of hogwash if our hearts are not anchored in the truth of God. And that is that God loves us and all he wants is for us to love him. When you accept that, now this is wrapping this up, last Sunday, that was the gist of the message, that when you function as a slave unto a master, or a worker unto a master, or a servant unto a master, and you don't understand your true identity as sons, as friends, as the bride, then you'll live your whole Christian life frustrated. Everything you do will be a cause of discontent. And the Lord said, the reason why some of you aren't finding fulfillment in your life is not because you don't come to church enough. It's not because you skip prayer or Bible study. It's because you don't even know why you own the earth. And so you've been reading books and hearing sermons and popping around from church to church trying to find a word. And this is the word of the Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Get up early in the morning and talk to the Father. Ask him, invite him into every area of your life. Ask the Holy Spirit to direct your steps. Show the love of Christ to everybody you meet. The simple gospel. Find yourself doing those things and guess what happens next? Then your destiny, then your purpose, then your business, then your ministry, then you fill in the blank, then it begins to manifest. Because the priority is the type of person you are, not what you do for God. Are you holy on the inside? Then love your wife. That's why some people don't understand why we're spending all this time talking about loving our wives and celebrating this time of covenant or love in this time of year. Because if I'm doing anything right as the preacher, if you believe anything right about God, you ought to love the woman you live with. If you can't love the woman you live with or take care of your children, then you need to go and get saved. 
You can sing and preach and holler and scream over top. All that noise is nothing but a clanging cymbal because you don't even know how to walk in love. Bitterness in your heart toward the woman you live with. Bitterness in your heart toward your husband. Oh, Lord, I lift your name on high. No, you don't. God is searching way deeper on the inside these days. I'm telling you, the end time church of Jesus Christ is not going to look like what you grew up on. We're not going to need the Hammond organ. We're not going to need the hoop and hollering. We're not going to need the attire. We're not going to need the form of godliness. We're going to need righteousness on the inside. That's what the bride of Christ looks like. That's the work of the Holy Spirit to make you holy. When the Holy Spirit comes, Jesus said he'll testify of me. That means when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, you will become obsessed with Jesus Christ. You are going to be saying, oh, I'm filled with the Spirit because I speak in tongues. You can speak in tongues and be nothing but noise. How much does Christ mean to you? How much does Jesus mean to you? When was the last time you sat there and meditated on the goodness of the Savior and said, God, I just love you for who you are? God said, that's the type of church I'm coming back for. And it begins with the top down. You know, whenever God wants to change something or a group of people, he always addresses the leadership. Throughout the Old Testament, God addressed the priests who were corrupt, the prophets who were corrupt, the fathers who were corrupt, the judges who were corrupt. And then God gets the people because once the leadership gets right with God, the overflow is that those following the leader are going wherever that man is going. That means if I'm just coming to church every Friday to be coming to church, then y'all just going to be coming to church to be coming to church more than likely. But if all of us can take our hearts before God and say, God, examine me and let the Lord honestly deal with you and, and ask you why you don't come to prayer. Why don't you come to Bible study? Why don't you give? He doesn't want you to come for the sake of coming. Do you want to? Do you desire him? If we can say, God, here I am, broken, undone, fix me as leaders, because all of us are leaders. Not just me or the elders and ministers of the church. You're a leader of your home. If your children are wayward and they're still under your roof, then lead them back to the Lord. Show them the way. Let them see father or their mother in love with God. If they see you just disconnected from church, halfway coming to church when you want to come, they're going to follow your example. Husbands, you want your wife to be more spiritual. Wives, you want your husband to be more spiritual. You be spiritual. You start a prayer meeting in your home. If the child sees the parent loving God, if the wife sees the husband loving God and vice versa, it will beget fire. Fire begets fire. How do you light a match? You take one match, you light another match. You only need to get one lit. And God said, this is what I want to do here in Hope City. I want to light you on fire again as the leader. I want to light all the leaders on fire. And then when people come in this atmosphere, they're going to be caught on fire with the very real presence of God. People coming up, oh, I want to join the church. I want to join the church. No, you don't. You just want to be around some new people. If you really want God, you'll be here. And you're going to be set on fire. And that's what I'm trying to tell us. What God has called us to do is require agreement. All of us have to come to the end of our proverbial rope, so to speak. And say, God, there are things in my heart that have drifted from you. If you want to be honest, if you don't want to keep going through the motions, waiting on the next sermon, waiting on the next word. All of us be honest have heard more sermons than we need for a lifetime. If we would just mix the word with faith, we'd be good. We only come to church. This is the truth about preaching. You should come to church to be encouraged. You should come to church to be reminded. You should come to church to hear a rhema word. If you're so far from God, you can't hear from God. You might receive a word that draws you back. But you are not meant to connect to God through a preacher. You have the Holy Spirit available to you who is the teacher who should lead and guide you into all truth. You have the pastor the leadership of the church whose job is to tell you about the Holy Spirit, whose job is to connect you to Jesus, who's our one mediator. But a lot of times, well, I don't want to go straight to the Lord. I don't want to go straight in prayer. I want to go ask the preacher what he has to say. I'm telling you, that paradigm is broken and done away with. It's the equivalent of an 8-track. Does anybody here own an 8-track? The system doesn't even work anymore. They're not making new 8-tracks. That religious mindset about how to connect to God is, is over with. So if you have not learned in this hour to go before God, which is your inheritance, and seek Him. Yes. Do business with God. Yes. 
then you haven't learned. You're not ready. And God says it's time to get ready. Because at the end of the day, Jesus is coming. Now that's the, that's the, the wrap on this whole message. I quoted several scriptures. I hope you caught on to some of them, but I want to read one scripture to you and then we'll pray and you'll be on your way. Second Corinthians chapter five. Really quick. I'm not going to take long on this. Verse number nine, chapter five, verse number nine says, therefore, we make it our aim, rather present or absent, to be well pleasing to him, not to men, but to him. For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but trusts are well known in your conscience. The Apostle Paul is reminding the church here that you are going to stand before God. See, when all this is said and done and you've gained your reputation of people, of being the on fire one, of being the leader in the church or being the whoever in your family, doesn't matter. At the end of the day, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And we're going to give an account to God for the things that we've done, good or bad. And I want to encourage some of you. Some of you are squandering. You are in a prodigal condition right now. You're resisting the voice of the Holy Spirit. You're actually doing what I was guilty of many times in this past year of hardening your heart. The scripture in Hebrew says, do not harden your heart as in the days of the rebellion. The idea there is that you have the ability to resist God and as a consequence, your heart becomes hard. So that means every time the Holy Spirit says knock, it says come to prayer. Every time the Holy Spirit knocks, it says come away with me and read my word and set my, your time apart with me. And you say, no, not today. Your heart is becoming harder. God said, I don't want your heart to be hard. I want to take out of you the hard heart, the stony heart, and give you a new heart. I want to recreate your heart. It's what David asked the Lord to do in Psalm 51. I want to make your heart as new. I want it to be fleshly. I want it to be able to be penetrated with my word. See, sometimes our heart is so hardened by our decisions to resist God, our absence from the believing community. And so when we hear the word of the Lord, the, the arrow of the word, it, it comes against the hard stone of our heart, doesn't cut us anymore. You remember that time when you got saved, you used to get convicted under preaching, but now you just wait till service is over because you really want to go watch the all-star game. You remember before you were consumed with the love for the world? This is where we've all been, if we'll be honest. And God said, I want to soften your heart. I want to comfort you with my love. I don't want you walking around feeling the burden of trying to be a good believer. I want you to enjoy me. I want this to be fresh for you. I told, they told those stories about you know, their, their romantic weekend. Beautiful stories. You know what's going to be really impressive? If 20 years from now or 30 years from now, the same types of stories are being told in those marriages. If the love with, with your earthly spouse should be getting better and better by and by, how much greater with Jesus, who's a perfect lover, who's never done wrong, who's never offended, who's never caused you to be insecure, who's never ever said anything bad about you or misunderstood you. We serve a perfect God, which means that our love with God, that relationship should be growing stronger by the day. We might go through seasons where we feel distant from God and sometimes the Lord will maybe withdraw his hand just to see if you'll go after him. Right. You know, when you were courting your wife or your husband, maybe they used to play or call that hard to get. She's playing hard to get. You know what I mean? And sometimes the Lord, just to see it, sometimes a girl wants to know if you really like her, she'll play hard to get. She'll just kind of draw back a little bit and see if you're willing to make that extra effort. And with God, it's not so that God can figure it out, but so that you can figure it out. Am I really willing to go after God? God already knows. But he'll withdraw his hands for a season just like he did in my life. And this pastor said, are you still going to go after me when you don't feel the goosebumps and the chills? Are you still going to show up when you're wrestling with confusion and you don't understand why you go through these changes in your mind all the time? Are you still willing to show up? And so, yes, I said, God. Even though I don't understand and I feel that there's so much that I'm doing wrong, I'm not giving up because you didn't give up on me. So I want to encourage you, those of you that feel 
like me and the Lord, we're just not tight like we used to be. I don't know what happened. I don't know if life came, if I got too busy. But God said, I am here for you. I'm here to restore you. I'm here to comfort you. I'm here to make that relationship new again. That's all he wants for you. See, when it's all said and done, we will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And then just think about it for a moment. We'll wrap it up here. Just do this little exercise with me and close your eyes. For the first time, maybe in a long time, think about the day when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Have you lost the trembling in your heart when it comes to the day of the Lord? Do you have even a little bit in your heart of a tremble of the fear of the Lord? Some of you have lost the fear of the Lord. Some of you used to reverence God. Some of you used to not even joke and play in the church because you knew that was the house of the Lord and you wanted to be fully pleasing before the Lord. But now the house of God is a casual place for you. Where you just come in and you don't care, you don't pray, you're just waiting to leave. And God said, I want to restore your heart. As he told Israel, I remember the kindness of your youth. How you went after me in the wilderness. And some of us have stopped chasing after God because we don't have Pharaoh chasing after us. Sometimes we only run into our God because we got trouble chasing us from behind. And the Lord has become our emergency help. And he is an emergency help. He's helping in time of need. But just because you don't got Pharaoh or this world or bondage chasing you doesn't mean you should stop running in the direction of God. And the Lord says some of you have slowed down because life has gotten easy. You slow down because you don't have the money trouble you used to have. You slow down your pursuit after God because you settled into a cushy place with him. And the Lord says, if you would come before him even today in your heart and begin to ask the Lord, Father, as you did it with Pastor Brian, as you've done it with many people, as you did it with your servant David, as you've done it with saints from all walks of life, God, restore the joy of my salvation. God, take me out of this religious, robotic, mechanic churchy, fake relationship and God give me a real heart after you. To the place where I remember what it was like to weep over lost souls. The place I remember what it was like to weep in your presence when I began to hear the worship in the church or the sanctuary how I instantly was engaged with you. Everybody focus. And you're standing before the judgment seat of Christ. And you see them, as the scripture said, they'll be there. Every nation, tribe, and tongue gathered around the throne. You'll stand there next to those you read about in Fox's Book of Martyrs. You'll stand there next to Leonard Ravenhill and A.W. Tozer. You'll stand there next to David. You see, all of us are going to be equal at the throne, at the judgment seat. There won't be special seating for the pastor. There won't be reserved parking for the apostle. But we'll all be clothed in fine white linen. We're all going to stare into the eyes of the Ancient of Days. What type of man or woman do you want to be on that day? Do you want to come before the judgment seat of Christ on that day, boasting in your resume, saying, I have done these good deeds, now receive me? Or will you come before the Lord saying, I have done nothing right. I have nothing good to offer, but the blood has washed me. Therefore, receive me by your mercy. See, that's the heart of a true son, a true worshiper. We realize that we have nothing to offer God. Yeah. And the Lord will pop your balloon time and time again till you realize that we are truly poor and needy, whether we realize it or not. And I pray that before you meet God, see, the truth is that you're either going to die very soon or one day before he comes and you'll meet him or he's going to come and you're going to meet him. We're going to meet God. And you're not going to bring a list of questions before God. You're not going to come before God with the 10 reasons why you couldn't serve him. You will be silent in that day. And every eye will look upon him whom they have pierced and they'll mourn because of him. When we see the glory and the majesty and the splendor of God, our hearts are going to every last one of our hearts is going to shatter. When we realize how much of a glorious, majestic savior that he truly is, that we did not know him for who he was. We'll be so sorrowful on that day when we hear the angelic choir and the saints of old singing with a loud voice the same song. And we'll regret every moment we resisted the precious Holy Spirit that was calling us to himself. We're going to feel great lamenting in that day. 
when we behold Jesus for who he is, if we don't ask the Lord now, God, open the eyes of my heart. God, give me a spirit of wisdom and revelation. I don't want to wait until the day where you declared that every knee would bow and every tongue would confess to bow my knee and to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Not just to save me from hell, but to receive my worship. Jesus Christ is Lord. And I say this in closing. Keep your eyes closed. This is an important footnote on this. Nothing in your life matters as much as you think it does. It doesn't matter. You've lost sleep over it. You've cried about it. You've complained about it. You've been confused about it. God said nothing matters such as this, that you are found faithful on that day. That you've been found clothed in fine white linen on that day. You throw out every ambition. You throw out every single goal you have for your life. Make this your aim to be fully pleasing unto the Lord. You may never have your name in headlights. You may never have a congregation or a crowd or some big name in front of people. But as the Apostle Paul said, we make it our aim to be fully pleasing before the Lord. And the Lord says that all you have to do to be fully pleasing before me is to offer me your heart. In spirit and in truth, offer me your broke pieces, torn apart heart. I'll receive your weakness. I'll receive your pain. And I'll heal you. I'll restore you. Your life will be made beautiful. Everything you've gone through in one moment with Jesus Christ, he can heal you. He can set you free. Keep your eyes closed. I want to ask you to respond if this category of people is you. And we're going to believe God together today for you to have that new beginning. If you're here today and you're like I described it myself in the past year, maybe it's in the past few years for you or a few days even, you just feel that you've become prodigal in your heart. And you say, Lord, I don't know what happened, but I'm not where I once was with you. I'm still faithful, but God, I just need a revival in my spirit. If that's you, I want you to stand on your feet. As soon as you hear that tug of the spirit, just stand on your feet if that's you. Amen. Anyone else, just stand on your feet. There's several people on their feet saying, Lord, I'm coming back to the heart of worship where it's all about you. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things that I've made it. I've been so preoccupied, God, with being a good boy and a good girl. I've been so preoccupied with living up to the purpose you said I had for my life. But Lord, I want to receive the spirit of adoption. Uh, I want to be set free. And I tell you, nothing moves God's hearts more than his people. Saying, Lord, here we are before you. Here we are, God. We, we have gone astray in our hearts, but God, revive us according to your word. The Lord said in his word that he's married to the backslider. He doesn't divorce you when you violate your part of the covenant. He said, I will betroth you to me forever in loving kindness and mercy. Your sins and your lawless deeds I will remember no more. I come to heal the brokenhearted. I come to set the captive free. I come to open the eyes of the blind. I see so many people on their feet, and I thank God for your honesty today because I'll tell you, it's never too late to begin again. It's never too late to begin again. I told the Lord, I said, Lord, if it all falls apart, I will rejoice in its desolation because I'll know that it wasn't built on the right foundation. And it's better to have everything in your life crumble when it's built on the wrong foundation than to succeed under the illusion that you've been doing it right. And some people just got to say, I'm willing to throw my resume in the trash. As Apostle Paul said, I throw those things away. I count them as loss. My aim of my life is that I might know him. And some of you are going to be free today. Some of you actually need to resist some of the prophecies you received because they weren't from the Lord. It wasn't from the Lord. Anybody that prophesies to you and talks about your financial status, that talks about your business status, and they haven't addressed the lover of your soul and the status of your soul, that's a false prophet. The prophet's job is to point you to the Savior. And some of you have sown seeds and given money to these trickeries of men, and God said, no, I want you to encounter the real Holy Spirit. Not this hallucination, not this emotional stuff. I want you to encounter the real Holy Spirit. So there's about 25 people or so on their feet that are responding to that. The rest of you who aren't responding, I want you to just take a moment and just begin to pray in the Holy Spirit. And ask the Holy Spirit, would He come and to heal? Would he, come and, would he come and touch the heart of these people? 
And I'm here as one who stood on this not even a week ago, made up my mind and said, Lord, I'm coming home. The Lord said, well, I'm coming out to meet you. I'm coming out to meet you. And here's the beautiful irony. You will do more for God as a true lover than you could ever do as a zealous worker. More for God as a zealous lover than a zealous worker. That's the inheritance. Let's pick that up a little bit, Jeremy. And I want you all, as you are standing on your feet, lift your hands up to the Lord. The rest of you can just pray for them with me. Tell the Lord thank you. Just tell him thank you. He's so good. He could have let us go astray. But he's a jealous husband. The Word of God says that jealousy is a husband's fury. And he's going to do something in your family, in our city, through you. But it begins with you connecting to him. Jealousy is a husband's fury. He's been fighting. The reason why you haven't had the promotion, the reason why you haven't had the open door, the reason why you haven't had your prayer answered was because if God would have did that for you, your heart would have gone even farther from him. And God said, I want you to know this today, that my priority for your life is that you know me. Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you said. You're going to be successful. You're going to be prosperous. You're going to abound in the work of the Lord. You're going to be used mightily by God. You're going to raise the dead and heal the sick and cleanse the lepers. And you're going to rebuke devils in his name. And you're going to do everything he called you to do. But at the end of the day, you're going to rest in this truth that you are his child. That you have been married to him. That you have been betrothed to him forever. And the unbelieving world is going to be jealous of that unconditional love. The unbelieving world that has had to work its way into acceptance, has had to work its way into approval, that has lived their whole life trying to earn the approval of man. When they see you and hear your story about a love that is unconditional, they're going to want it. And you're going to sit there and you're going to open your mouth and you're going to have tears swell up in your eyes as you tell them about a God that loved you when you were unlovable. A God that promised to never leave you nor forsake you. Through your testimony, the curse of fatherlessness is going to be broken off of this nation. Through your testimony, through your words, the curse of broken covenant and divorce is going to be broken off of this nation. Then I tell you, when you taste the love that's unconditional, which is sweeter than honey, on the honeycomb, there's no excuse. And God said, that's your inheritance. That's the work I've called you to join me in. Whether you do it as a businessman, as a teacher, as a doctor, as a lawyer, as an employee at Target, as an uh, accountant, whatever you find your plot to do in life, you do it as unto the Lord. And men are going to see Jesus and be drawn to that love in your heart. So with your hands lifted up, I'm going to pray for you. And then Jerry's going to take us out with a love song to the Lord. Father, we thank you. Lord, we are all today repentant, Lord. And we apologize. We confess. We turn from our own hearts God's deception. Lord, your word says, unless you build the house, they that build it labor in vain. And God, all those who stand on their feet this day who acknowledge that they need you, who say, God, I have drawn away in my heart and I want to come back home. Father, do what you do best. Draw us with the tenderness of your love. Draw us with the goodness and the mercy and the truth of your word. Draw us with the conviction of sin. Draw us, God, in mercy to come home again. God, every day that we've wasted, may we redeem the time. Every year that we've wasted in confusion and grumbling and complaining, may we redeem the time through the Holy Spirit. May you restore the joy of salvation for each of these people, God, who stood on their feet. For God, you said in your word that you who hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. And I pray, Father, today that you give us an appetite for you. That you give us a desire for you. God, that when this world tries to pull at our heart, may there be a standard raised up in resistance in our heart. God, we love you. And just take a few moments and just talk to the Lord. Ask the Lord, talk to Him in your own words, in your own heart. What do you believe in Him to do in this next year? Do you believe that you're going to love Him like you've never loved Him before?
this is how that happens. You receive his love. All of our love, if it's true, is always a response to his love for us. Some of you are going to stop trying to love God and respond to the love of God. It's a whole other experience. So, Father, we say do that in a mass level, God, across this city, across this nation. Raise up a people, everyone on their feet with me as we go out on this. We're going to pray this last prayer together that God would raise up a people. That God would raise up his end time church that has one thing that they desire, one thing that they seek after. Lord, we pray today that you would make our hearts to burn. Lord, that you would restore the fire on the altar of our hearts in this nation. God, that you would restore the fire on our hearts once again in the church. Where you no longer, God, are, are asked for help to build a building and then get kicked out of the building once we have the building. God, we pray, restore fervent love for the Lord in our heart. May we be known as a generation that sought your heart in your face. God, we pray supernatural strength and blessing over all those who are here today. God, may the anointing to love you be strong and heavy in every life. God, may the desire for your word, the desire to seek your face, be strong and heavy in every life. Quiet every storm in our heart. Quiet every voice of confusion. Quiet every voice of accusation in the name of Jesus. And for those that want to know you, God, we ask you, reveal yourself unto them. Those that want to walk free from sin, reveal yourself unto them. Those that want to be planted by the streams of living water, reveal yourself to them. And may this be the day that we look back on and say, that was the day when God turned my morning into dancing. That was the day when God gave me beauty for ashes. That was the day when the Lord turned back my captivity and set me free from the heart out. God, we say, this is the day of salvation. This is the day that you've made. Lord, we worship you. We give you glory. We give you honor. And we give you praise. If you would, hold the hand of your neighbor. Does anybody feel a release in their own heart? You just don't. You know the pressure's off. together tonight, or today rather, we're doing this to symbolize what we believe God to do in the days to come, to unify the church, especially here at Hope City, we're believing God to connect our hearts, that God would truly get the glory out of this community of people.